Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the second session of our event. I would like to once again invite Ms. Christine Nakamura to continue the second session of our event. Thank you, Henry. Welcome back, everybody. I hope everybody had a chance to stretch their legs a little bit and uh, because we have an exciting program ahead of us again. And now I am very pleased to invite Mr. Winston Chen, representative of the Taipei Economic Cultural Office in Ottawa to introduce the minister. Over to you, Representative Chen. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Christine. Wang'an, good evening, bonsoir, friends in Canada. Zao'an, good morning, bonjour to those in Taiwan. It is my great pleasure to introduce Taiwan's Digital Minister, Honorable Audrey Tan, to all the delegates of the first virtual Canadian women-only business mission to Taiwan. I have the honor of receiving Minister Tang twice in Ottawa in the past. I also participate in a closed virtual event hosted by Asia Pacific Foundation, which featured Minister Tang as a keynote speaker to share Taiwan's unique and successful experience in combating the COVID-19 pandemic through innovation and inclusion. Minister Tang was a child prodigy, reading works of classical literature before the age of five, advanced mathematics before six, and the programming before eight. At the age of 19, Minister Tang had worked in Silicon Valley as an entrepreneur and found enough success to retire by 33, and become Taiwan's youngest cabinet minister at the age of 35. The incredible success of Minis Tang has led her to be named among the top 20 most influential people in digital government. And she was this 100 global thinker by the foreign policy magazine. Minister Tang has worked hard to create a more open government, which is transparent, accessible, and interacts openly with the civil society. She has helped cultivate Taiwan's digital democracy, including by introducing measures that allow citizens to submit policy ideas for the government's consideration. Minister has led efforts to combat digital disinformation and foreign interference while promoting truthful information. One of her most famous strategies during the pandemic was the use of humor over rumor to make light of fake news narratives while simultaneously correcting the record. Minister Tang has made spectacular contribution in fighting the pandemic. Her innovative and digital responses, such as developing apps for contact tracing and the mask availability monitoring have been widely praised. While I could go on, I would rather stop here and then pass the floor to Minister Tang. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Xie xie. Um, so, yeah, as I mentioned before turning on the mic, this is the first time uh, of the hybrid model uh, for me, where I need to look into the camera most of the time and audience only occasionally. <laughs> so uh, I'll try to make this work. Um, good local time to friends uh, joining us physically and virtually, uh, regardless of your time zone. Good local time. Uh, first, I would like to extend my warmest greetings to the Canadian Women-Only Virtual Business Mission to Taiwan and express my gratitude to the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada for organizing this event. And your kind invitation for me, it is my great honor to be able to contribute uh, to the first ever Canadian Women Only Business Mission to Taiwan. 
this is a very meaningful event, providing an opportunity for female leaders from Taiwan and Canada to interact and exchange opinions on how to explore and fully realize women's potential in business. I dialed in on the previous uh, session on my way here <laughs> to listen to CEO and uh, other topics, and I learned a lot from the social entrepreneurship uh, angle. So it's my observation that women's role in global governance is becoming more and more significant, especially when the world economy is heavily impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic and the building back after the pandemic. In fact, uh, many journalists reported uh, when looking at how different countries deal with the COVID-19 pandemic, countries with women leaders uh, such as New Zealand and Taiwan seem to have performed better <laughs> against the pandemic. So uh, really happy to share with you all here. Now, um, and so you, you've been looking at this slide called Digital Social Innovation, uh, and this is the three principles that we have uh, been working on to make sure that when we fight the pandemic, we don't have to resort to top-down heavy measures such as lockdown, which people had a little bit of experience in 2003 here when SARS 1.0 hits and, and nobody want to go back uh, to that model. Uh, so we have to innovate and find something new. and. Uh, here is um, the uh, basic idea of what's uh, new about this, what we call the all of society of uh, people-public partnership um, model, people-public-private partnership um, when fighting the pandemic with no lockdowns and the infodemic with no takedowns. And it has three pillars. Um, it's fast, it's fair, and it's fun. The fast part pertains to the collective intelligence. As some of you know, uh, Dr. Li Wenliang, the whistleblower from Wuhan, although he didn't save the people in Wuhan, uh, he did save people in Taiwan uh, by sounding the alarm about, and I quote, seven new SARS cases in the Huanan seafood market around the turn of the year in uh, late December 2019. And it immediately get upvoted by the Taiwanese equivalent of Reddit, thanks to the sharing of a very young doctor, No More Pipe was her uh, nickname uh, on the PTT, uh, and people upvoted that triaged uh, look at the Li Wenliang's message and see it as legit, which is why we started the health inspections for flight passengers coming in from Wuhan to Taiwan the very next day, which is the first day uh, of 2020. Now, uh, the PTT, while I just said that it's a equivalent of Reddit, it's actually not equivalent because Reddit is private infrastructure for online discussion is a private company. And PTT being a national Taiwan University student's pet project that has been running for decades, uh, open source, is firmly in the social sector as a digital public infrastructure. Uh, the PTT has no shareholders uh, to report to. It doesn't have any advertisers to uh, please. So all the upvoting and so on that goes on the PTT is based on the merit of those messages which is why we were able to surface and amplify Dr. Li Wenliang's message better than any um, private sector advertisement funded and so on public infrastructures. I'm not saying that the private sector uh, communication or messaging platform doesn't have its place, but for things of public benefit and like early warning system and so on, I would argue that digital public infrastructure like town halls and public parks in the analog world uh, works better to get people's signals together. So this relates relies on two things that Taiwan and Canada shares. One is a very active social sector where people would voluntarily put their time into triaging such messages. And the second is the government uh, makes sure that everyone enjoy a complete freedom of uh, information, of speech and assembly of the press and so on, so people can talk about uh, SARS 2.0, SARS coming again, uh, freely without fearing repercussions of being harmonized uh, as in other jurisdictions. And so this is a fundamental uh, thing that enabled the fast response of public infrastructure. And adding to that, we also have the government citizen feedback cycle, and I didn't mean the audio feedback. Uh, it's a, a point about the uh, 1922. 
And this toll-free number, uh, it's really not cutting-edge technology. It's just a call center that you can call from a landline. On the other hand, it's very inclusive and accessible. Yeah, very young people, very old people, they're all welcome to call 1922. There's more than 2 million calls last year uh, pertaining to COVID that everyone can get the epidemiology ideas explained to them in a personalized uh, individual uh, education program uh, and by the power of the call center. And the other way it works too. People are free to call uh, to suggest new innovations uh, of correcting the government's course uh, when things go wrong. And their ideas get amplified by the next day's 2 p.m. Uh, Central Epidemic Command Center press conference. So one well-known case, uh, but I'll mention it anyway because it relates to gender mainstreaming, pertains to uh, last uh, April when a very young boy called 1922 saying that, hey, you're rationing out mask, but um, well, all I get, the young boy said, is pink medical grade mask, but all the boys uh, in the class uh, have navy blue um, surgical mask. So the boy doesn't want to go to school because he only has pink mask, what to do? The call center people couldn't handle it. It's, it's not in the frequently asked questions. Uh, so it gets <laughs> escalated <laughs> immediately to the CECC. And the participation officer, the team in charge of public engagement, immediately suggested that medical officers in the live streamed uh, press conference the very next day all wear pink. So <laughs> the CECC medical officers, regardless of uh, gender, wore pink for quite some time, the mayors, the premier, everyone <laughs> wore pink medical masks for the uh, ongoing weeks. And the uh, Minister of Health and Welfare, Minister Chen Shizhong, even said that Pink Panther was his childhood idol, childhood hero. Um, so the boy become the most hip boy in the class, for only he has the color that the heroes wear, and the uh, color that heroes, heroes wear, <laughs> right, the Pink Panther. Uh, and, and so this is, of course, a great um, anecdote for gender mainstreaming, but the same thing goes on uh, for example, for mass distribution, for innovating, like using traditional rice cookers to kill the virus but doesn't kill the mask, <laughs> to essentially double or quadruple uh, the mask supply, and so on. Any new idea that goes to the 192 to become uh, public knowledge uh, by the next 2 p.m. So that's the fast part of collective intelligence. The fair part pertaining to mask rationing, as I mentioned, uh, because at the beginning of the pandemic last February, uh, we had a real shortage problem problem as with many other countries uh, in medical grade mask. At the time, we produced not even 2 million medical masks a day in a country of 23 million people. So we probably have to ration it somehow. But even before the government think of the rationing strategy or anything like that, uh, there's a civic technologist, uh, the name is Howard Wu, Wu Jianwei from Tainan City, that just coded up this map out of nowhere. Um, he asked his friends and families to look at the stores that still carry uh, some inventory of masks and report which one runs out and which ones still have some uh, in stock. Uh, this is great because it reduces queuing time, uh, but it's not great for uh, Howard Wu's um, bank accounts because he used Google API. So overnight he owed Google 20K US dollars uh, just by <laughs> setting this up. And so he's like, I don't worry about it anymore because it's bankrupting money and <laughs> somebody else will probably fix it. <laughs> and so he asked for help on the GovZero uh, channel, the G0V channel, Taiwan's leading uh, social sector civic technologist movement. And people suggest various ways for him to switch to free software, to open source software, to save money, and so on. Uh, but one of the people who contributed was yours truly was me. So I brought his idea to the premier, saying that we really need to trust the citizens with open data, meaning that we need to enable more how we're, when we're doing the mask rationing so that uh, everyone can absorb the cost and I also helped negotiating with Google, so Google waived his usage fees. <laughs> um, and in exchange of uh, me placing Howard Wu's uh, implementation above OpenStreetMap, uh, so that people would still see that it's Google sponsored. So that's a pretty good people public private partnership. So the idea here is that uh, since we digitized the national health insurance after, right after SARS 1.0 in 2004, uh, nowadays we have not only broadband as human right, but we have fiber optic connections from all the 6,000 pharmacies with the pharmacists trusted by local communities uh, to the national health insurance. So every time that a mask is sold in any pharmacy, everyone can see in real time like this 58 adult uh, masks uh, goes down to 56, 54, 52. While you're queuing in line, you can 
and check your phone so that everybody can see that this is being distributed in a fair fashion and everyone can suggest how to distribute it better. And this is great because when we publish things uh, once every 30 seconds, people can do dashboards uh, such as this one. Uh, if we publish uh, every quarter, <laughs> then people cannot co-create. So real-time open data or open API publishing upon collection is like the uh, digital data fabric that is the strata on top of which digital social innovations can grow. I still vividly remem remember uh, when we wrote this out on the map, I was very happy about it because I can overlay the population map on the uh, pharmacy map, and I see it's a almost complete correspondence, meaning that we're very fair in the distribution of the medical grade mask. But just a few weeks later, uh, a MP, uh, Gao Hong An uh, of the TPP, uh, who did an interpolation to Minister Chen Shizhong saying that a court open street map community, this is actually not fair because if you look at the rural places, the time cost that uh, each person need to go to a nearby pharmacy, even though the physical distance on the map is the same, the opportunity cost, the time cost is not the same. So that the rural people, when they go to the pharmacy, maybe the pharmacy have already closed. Uh, but th because this is such an evidence-based interpolation, it helps that MP Gao Hong was VP of data data analytics at Foxconn. So she knows something about data and understatement. She knows a lot about data. Uh, so when, when she did the interpolation, uh, Minister Chen simply said, legislator, teach us. And, and what a great response from a cabinet minister, right? Uh, so uh, you can do better, so let's uh, do it your way. So the very next day, uh, we introduced pre-ordering in 24-hour convenience stores. We introduced a new distribution mechanism suggested by MPGAL and the OpenStreetMap community. Uh, and MPGAL was very happy and posted on social media, said yesterday's interpolation become tomorrow's co-creation. So that is how fairness is guaranteed by pretty much everyone, including the four uh, leading convenience stores that expanded the 6,000 pharmacies to the almost uh, 20,000 points of mask pre-ordering and collection. And finally, uh, because this is a stressful, stressful time, um, so uh, people do have a lot of conspiracy theories. There's a lot of um, uneasiness, for example, when there's a mask shortage. Uh, one of the trending disinformation at the time uh, was that of panic buying. Uh, there was a rumor that said, and I quote, uh, all the tissue paper manufacturers are uh, being nationalized and all the tissue paper material are being confiscated to make medical grade masks. So we'll run out of tissue paper soon, uh, go out and buy. Uh, well, we, it ended up, we, we discovered that it started by tissue paper resellers, go figure. <laughs> but we didn't know that <laughs> at the time. So we just know that people run out and, and buy all the tissue papers they can find on the store and so on. Uh, so we need to work on some way to counter this panic-induced uh, infodemic. And the way we do that is through the power of humor, because humor and fun travels even faster than outrage uh, and polarized uh, ideas. So uh, within just a couple hours, uh, the Premier Su Jin Chang, you just saw his front side, and this is his back side. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, like both sides are very mimetic worthy. Uh, anyway, so uh, as part of a popular meme, uh, internet meme, uh, our Premier Su Jin Chang, um, you know, uh, said this wordplay. Uh, 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 and, and the full Mandarin is, uh, uh, but this is a wordplay because a Mandarin to stockpile twin sounds exactly the same as bottoms twin. Uh, and so it's very easy to remember. But uh, this is actually serious uh, policy information here that says tissue papers are made out of uh, South American materials and medical grade masks, which is really a plastic product are made of domestic materials. There really is no way confiscating one uh, will make the, the other work. It just simply makes no sense. And because this is really uh, viral, this is went absolutely viral on the social media. So within just a couple of days, the original rumor uh, just died down and replaced by this uh, humor fun message. And this is not just a one-off thing. We have a very cute spoke stock, a Shiba Inu, uh, the name is Zong Chai, um, actually is a companion animal of the participation office of the Minister of Health and Welfare. So every time they finish a 2 p.m. press conference, uh, the officer just walks back. Uh, they live just a, a block or two away from the uh, building of the MOSHW and take new photos 
of the dog. Uh, and that's that uh, physical distance. When you're outdoor, keep two dogs away from one another, wear a mask. If you're indoor, uh, keep three Shiba Inus away. Remember to cover your mouth and nose when sneezing. Don't do what a dog does here. Uh, and this is a masterpiece. Uh, this says uh, wear a mask to uh, protect you from shishoshou, which is very hard to translate, uh, to protect your own face from your own unwashed hand. And this message appeals to rational self-interest. Rather than saying, um, you know, uh, protecting the elderly, protecting your parents, protecting the uh, frontline medical workers, and so on, this says wear a mask to protect yourself from your own unwashed hands, which links mask use and hand sanitation together, which is really the only way that the PPE, the mask uh, policy, would work. So with that, we get three-quarter of people um, get access to masks, wearing them regularly, cleaning their hands by April, and around that time, the R value, the basic transmission rate, drops to below one, and then uh, we move to like a slightly post-COVID uh, timeline. So this is uh, my um, initial sharing. I look forward uh, to the fireside chat. Um, you can check out more at TaiwanCanHelp.us. I think um, we're natural partners uh, in working on digital social innovation because we do share with Canada the values such as freedom, democracy, and human rights. So I look forward uh, with the following fireside chat with Ms. Janice Fukakusa. Thank you. Minister Yang, I think that Christine Nakamura was going to speak. I don't know if it's working. I don't know. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you just fine. Oh, here she is. Sorry about that. Thank you so much, Minister. I mean, you always, always amaze us when uh, you speak, and it's just a delight to have you with us again. So thank you very much for that presentation. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Janice Fukaksa. She is the Chancellor of Ryerson University in Toronto and the former COO of the largest bank in Canada, RBC. And she's going to uh, moderate the discussion with you. So over to you, Janice. Thank you very much, Christine. And thank you, Minister Tang, for all of the insights that you've given us, not just in this talk today, but, but you were a guest of Asia Pacific Foundation uh, a few months back, and, and we all we're very impressed, especially with the results you have in Taiwan. And I have a question about, about um, capital and the civic tech movement in Taiwan. There's lots of uh, innovation there and ideas, and you speak about social innovation to develop new business models. So how does Taiwan direct resor resources, financial or other types of resource to empower innovation, especially the type that doesn't target to generate traditional profit and return on investment. For example, what are the social metrics of success? And maybe you could talk a bit about stakeholder capitalism and how, how you, this transition that you've made in terms of the good of citizens and the open trend and transparent economy. Thank you. Uh, it's a very good question. Should I unmute my video? Oh, okay. It magically works. Technology, yes. So um, I think it's um, a couple of things. First, uh, Taiwan already have a very strong charity, social enterprise, co-op based social sector. So many of the largest charities uh, they own social enterprises, um, the ones working on uh, regional revitalization, working on um, equity in development, uh, and so on. These uh, all already like recycling uh, even glass, right, uh, and making it a business. Uh, I'm talking about uh, the like double or triple recycling pipeline uh, from, say, the uh, Ciji, uh Foundation, as well as the Chunchi uh, Glassworks, and so on. So there's already a self-sustaining, participatory um, co-op-ish um, ecosystem that forms the nucleus of the social innovation uh, or impact capitalism. And on the perimeter of that, we're now looking at a configuration where many people are not even running publicly listed companies, whereas, of course, now there's a duty to do GRI reporting, to do impact 
like investment and things like that. But for the majority of Taiwanese enterprises, the small and medium businesses, they're all very willing to integrate uh, into the supply chain by working with uh, vendors and supply chain partners listed on the public social innovation index. And the index doesn't uh, restrict whether it needs to be a co-op or a foundation or a charity. Uh, it could also be for profits with purpose companies as long as they do the scorecards using SROI, SRS, the B-Lab scorecard or things like that. All we're asking is a accountability um, and people who participate in this supply chain integration who make a um, like millions, uh, like five million anti dollars per year in purchase and so on, uh, get an award uh, from yours truly. <laughs> and we do also uh, procurement and investment incentives and loan incentives uh, for all the small and medium businesses that uh, declare um, their stakeholder uh, benefits balance scorecards using the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goals Index and so on. And adding to that, um, all the cross-sectoral partnerships for the public purpose also have the yearly presidential hackathon. Um, and if you check the presidential hackathon out, you can see that um, there is no uh, prize money, unlike the uh, more commercial hackathons, but the award is really a trophy. And the trophy um, is the shape of Taiwan uh, with a micro projector underneath. And if you turn on the micro projector, it projects our president, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, handing you the trophy, so it's a self-describing trophy, uh, and promising whatever you did will become national-wide policy as if it's a presidential promise within the next 12 months. So the executive power is the presidential award. Um, and on the selection of presidential hackathon, we use novel voting mechanisms such as quadratic voting and so on to make sure that it reflects a balanced synergy across the environmental, the social, and the economic ideas. So some of the winning ideas include, for example, um, a augmented reality tool for people to plant trees. Uh, together, uh, for example, a Pokemon Go-like game that encourage people uh, who are outdoors uh, to refill their bottles at Pokemon stations, um, really drinking fountains, uh, and earning points and completing missions, and they will uh, form a new habit uh, instead of buying plastic bottles. Uh, or, for example, people using that app will get push notifications when there is a heat damage uh, risk and things like that. All of this have provable impact in the SROI framework, but probably not so much in the ROI framework, so it makes sense for the government to sponsor to essentially subsidize those data fabrics without going to the way to the procurement because we use open data and real-time open API. Everyone can build new ecosystems based on those shared digital fabric. So that, that is excellent with respect to innovation. So rather than using a carrot and stick approach, it's all really about the carrots and also about, uh, I, I think that a lot of the way that you handled the, the COVID in terms of the uh, fast, fair and fun was is part of that equation because of the transparency and the speed at which things done and re that really aided the digital innovation. So uh, I think it's, it's admirable to advance those goals so quickly in Taiwan. And you know, as you know, they've been decades in the making and it's all been about the punishment of, of shame, right? Of not of not reporting your goals. This is about the reward of making it, it better for everyone, the citizens and the world. So I think that's fantastic. And I hope that uh, you're a shining example of it. Now, one of the things you do is collect a lot of data and you know in, in certain countries and, and I think in Canada to some extent, people get a little bit paranoid about all of the data collected by uh, the government and then how, how it's being used in that. So how does Taiwan continue to support uh, principles of open government and how open should governments be and what are the potential benefits and costs for all governments operating under these principles? We'd be interested in your views on that. Thank you. Uh, again, very good question. Uh, it's probably a question worth at least three-day seminar, but I'll try to answer that yeah. in three minutes. Um, uh, I think uh, one of the core idea 
of a people-public-private partnership or a data coalition, as we call it here, is based on norm setting. Just as we don't talk about, uh, you know, text collection, text production, uh, what's the norm for sharing text, right? It doesn't even make sense. Um, there's a journalistic norm. There's a academic norm. There is a norm around so-called intellectual property, but it's actually copyright and patents and all that. Uh, it makes sense to talk about different norms in different communities. And so because of that, when we talk about the data coalition, we don't mean so much as people just downloading data or contributing data. We mean that people make useful narratives out of the data that we collectively um, make together. Uh, one case in point, um, is the national health care. Uh, like Canada, we have a single-payer uh, universal health care. Uh, and in the uh, Taiwanese population, there's more than one quarter people, five million and counting, uh, who downloaded the NHI Express, the National Health Insurance app. And with the app, one can, uh, of course, pre-order mask. But in, in, uh, in addition to that, uh, we can also download the uh, X-ray scans. Uh, I think CT scans also, uh, all the uh, visit records uh, and the prescriptions uh, by the pharmacists, uh, the doctors and dentists, and so on. So it become a, a single entry portal to all the medical data that you have in the care of the clinics. So you can correct them. Uh, you can contribute to, say, diabetes longitudinal study uh, using an SDK on that app. Uh, you can even, if you uh, have sufficient mask uh, in your home, you can refrain from collecting your uh, mask ration, which is 10 per two weeks nowadays, uh, and then just with a click of a button, dedicate your uncollected quota to international humanitarian aid uh, in exchange of a uh, what we call non-fungible token, a token of appreciation <laughs> of uh, your name uh, being listed on Taiwan can help that us, right? So this is a data coalition where people who care about international humanitarian aid can send a very strong and clear signal to the Foreign Service uh, to give out this uh, to the countries and indigenous First Nations uh, in need. Um, and similar data coalitions uh, exist for, for example, in primary schools, people set up air boxes to uh, measure the PM 2.5 real-time air quality together. And when they grow to almost tens of thousands, uh, I think around 8,000 now, um, it creates a tremendous pressure on the environmental minister. But we can't beat them, so we must join them. So we negotiated with the social sector and then agreed to install their design of microclimate sensors into, uh, say, industrial parks, because the municipal government owned the lamp in the industrial parks. Again, the social sector sets the norm. The public sector amplifies it, and the private sector work with an ecosystem and economy defined by those norms. Very similar things uh, um, exist for public campaign donation and expenditure records. And Facebook, uh, at around the end of 2019, I think Taiwan is one of, if not the uh, first jurisdiction, where they publish the entire advertisement library in real time, open data, and open API, because they understand uh, the social sector threatens. Uh, civil disobedience uh, when we in the National Auditing Office didn't publish it as Open API. And we, when we finally do, Facebook is the next to face social sanction if they don't publish uh, this kind of Open API for the transparency uh, in election uh, campaign financing and so on. So election campaign finance data. Um, environment data, uh, personal health care data, really there is almost nothing in common. Uh, but what the, is consistent is that the social sector must set the norm and the public sector must work with, not just for, the people in those norms. So that, that involves a, a lot of very quick pivoting because, because there, the cycles are really short. How do you do that and maintain regulation and also support innovative technologies because to me it just it, it seems that they're both at odds but you've managed to solve for all of that with with speed too a huge amount of speed definitely indeed uh, this pertains to the bandwidth of democracy if all we have is traditional voting, that's maybe three bits per person every four years. So it's really low bit rate uh, communication. And the uh, cabinet and the legislature uh, get into those four-year cycles uh, in terms of technological adaptation. But as you pointed out very uh, acutely, that this emerging technologies operate on a hour-to-hour -hour basis. So our bandwidth from the people to the uh, public sector 
need to also work on a very similar uh, basis. So, for example, in 2015, uh, when Uber X first came to Taiwan, uh, then Minister Jacqueline Tsai, who is in the audience, <laughs> pioneered the use of uh, AI uh, in policy making, uh, and we run together. Um, I was a consultant back then <laughs> uh, to the project. Um, so the idea is that we run a AI-powered conversation so that people who really had anything to say um, about the Uber X phenomena, uh, instead of debating endlessly whether it's sharing economy or gig economy uh, or platform economy or whatever, uh, we just look at what's actually happening. And then uh, this is my real friends and families and the clusters that I feel about the Uber X uh, situation. And the point here is that each person can contribute their feeling. Like I feel passenger insurance is very important and people may disagree or agree uh, with me. And as they do, they move uh, further close to me or farther away from me. But uh, this picture, which is very much worth sharing, <laughs> is that every time we run such a conversation after, I think, three weeks in the UberX case, um, we see that people agree to disagree on a few ideological statements. But by far, people agree with each other's feelings, most of the feelings, most of the time, with most of their neighbors. All we had to do is to flip around the traditional anti-social uh, corner of social media and build a pro-social social media that is based on the agree and disagree, but there's no reply button, so there's no room for troll to grow. And the visualization visualizes the plurality, the diversity of the voices and not the number of people. So if you get 5,000 people in voting exactly the same way, well, the number may change change, but the area doesn't change. And we hold into uh, account this crowdsource agenda setting and only deliberate on the rough consensus on insurance, um, not undercutting existing meters, uh, on the fair registration and things like that, which are then made into the law on multi-purpose taxis. So Uber is now a local Taiwan company <laughs> obeying the same taxi rules, which also enable existing co-ops like line, uh, also line taxi new entries um, into the market. So that is a rough consensus in the sense that uh, not everyone is 100% happy, but people can live with it. Everyone can live with it. And this um, process is very, very fast. It operates on a weekly basis, and it's just three weeks, four weeks before we can get a rough consensus from the people. So how do you drive people into that dialogue? Because it, usually those sorts of dialogues start with a few dissenters, but how do you drive them in? Is it through the constant iteration of, of driving uh, down the facts that seem to be the most important and most likely to be a sort of consensus building because that, that's a that's a long process or is it, it, it because you're using AI but you still need a little thinking guidance too right it's definitely um, and the, the trick here is that uh, it's fun and because it's fun it's made into the civics classes <laughs> In our curriculum, uh, starting 2019, uh, we've got record number of people who are not even 18 years old, like very young people, uh, petitioning for such crowdsource agenda setting to happen in our national participation platform, join the GOV, the TW, more than one quarter of citizens' initiatives uh, are from people younger than 18 years old. Uh, it's uh, their civics class assignment. Uh, the teachers just told those young senior high school people to start social movements uh, as their capstone project. And, and many of them actually worked very well. We've ha had a 16-year-old person uh, who initiated the gradual banning of plastic straws uh, in the national identity drink, the bubble tea. Um, it was quite controversial <laughs> at the time, but eventually she got uh, 5,000 people's support and accelerated the pace uh, the EPA uh, has in finding uh, sustainable and biodegradable alternatives uh, to the plastic straws and so on. There's an abundance of such uh, cases, and it's not because we mobilize people to do it, but people do it because it's fun, it's meaningful, mm -hmm. it makes a really good um, like uh, learning record in their capstone project. Uh 16 year old to now is 19 years old and she's already uh, our national commissioner on open government national action plan so which looks really good on his uh, on her uh, career in CV. Well that's fantastic because you know how there's always a tension between regulation and supporting innovation and the need to protect citizens but still encourage value cr uh, creation through the the technology. How uh, to me, that the role of government has totally shifted 
to be a partner and not protecting one adversary versus the other. How long did it take in, in, the, in the development of Taiwan's social and stakeholder capitalism to do that? Because Taiwan is a very entrepreneurial country. And, our, and I think that entrepreneurial and, and it's a, um, it is a capitalist society and has, uh, you guys have managed to overlay all of the social good on top of it and integrate it with that whole, um, the profitability and, and being in free enterprise sort of construct of the economy. It's very interesting, the role of government in that, because it seems, it seems to be heavy handed, but not in the least because the citizens seem to really be supportive. Yeah, thank you. Um, indeed, uh, the thing that drove me uh, into uh, doing full-time job as opposed to just a part-time contractor uh, in the central cabinet uh, is actually one sentence in Dr. Tsai Ing-wen's inauguration speech for her first term as president where she said, before we think of democracy as a showdown between two opposing values, but from now on, democracy must become a conversation of many diverse values. And this wording, uh, democracy must become, uh, speaks to me saying that democracy is also a type of technology. Just as social science is also science, social technology is also technology. And increasing the bit rate of democracy allows us to form more coherent positions so that even for people with very different positions, we can still get a glimpse of common values out of those high bit rate real time conversation that respond to the here and now. So so I would say that many positional differences are actually a good thing if we have good social technology, that's to say democracy, that can get those shared values in real time. And so people can innovate on delivering those values without leaving anyone behind. So that, that's absolutely fantastic, Minister Yang, because it's like the nirvana of what's happening. And one of the things as I was, I was uh, go, oh, going through and listening to your TED Talks and that I, I thought, that how insightful to look at the the climate change because I I, I really think that that people are waking up only because now they think that you know depending on how old you are of course so I think that it's actually going to impact my grandchildren so that's someone I can see today but and and with the pandemic it was one month not one generation or two generations. So to speed up this whole evolution, the question I have for you is how can we get other countries to look at this model and pursue it? Because the amount of cooperation on the pandemic is phenomenal, but that's because everyone has agreed they're facing the same pandemic. Not everyone has agreed about climate change, although they're talking about it, right? But you don't have that consensus. But how, how can you do this? It, and technology is the enabler, but how do you make that more universal as the enabler? Yeah, um, I think uh, in many democratic countries, one of the associated risks with the pandemic is the infodemic. Arguably, the infodemic caused more fear, uncertainty, and doubt in many jurisdictions um, compared to the pandemic. And uh, paradoxically, the more liberal, the more democratic uh, the jurisdiction is, the more likely that some variation of infodemic or the other uh, will take hold in the population if there's no uh, counter infodemic public infrastructure, I mean the digital public infrastructure in place. I think Taiwan and Canada are pretty good when it comes to local journalism, uh, when it comes to digital competence, when it comes to citizens' willingness to voluntary um, their their work on the voluntary sector or the social sector, as we call it here, uh, to get the accurate reporting of whether it's mask availability or um, the, what ha really is happening in their neighborhood. Uh, but in many uh, countries, there are divisive points that were previously seen as irreconcilable, uh, like um, ideologies and so on. And I think 
it's uh, one of the things that Canada and Taiwan can work on together through, say, presidential hackathon, through many uh, co-creation and innovative means to show other democracies that you don't have to make the false dilemma, the false trade-off uh, between the civic freedoms on one side uh, and stability and economic growth on the other, which is uh, what many uh, jurisdictions are seen as an inevitable choice during the height of the pandemic. But after the pandemic, just as we did in 2004, I think it's time for everyone to take a systemic look and say, uh, maybe we can counter the pandemic and then the infodemic using this sort of cross-sectoral partnership without the government assuming everything in a top-down way uh, is all sticks uh, and that um, accidentally destroys the agency of the social sector, uh, but instead work, as you said, um, carrot-only basis, uh, preferably with carrots that shape like Lego blocks so everyone can remix it. Exactly. that, And that's fantastic because I think that, that one of the lessons that I take from the Taiwanese um, experiences that with SARS and the lockdown, it is all within your line of sight and your memory, and you don't want to do that. So you'll do anything you can not to do that. With the whole world experiencing varying degrees of, of this, you see the lessons learned can be turned around very quickly. And, and I just uh, want to give you one observation. I, I've been uh, heavily in financial services. And during the financial crisis, it took the government a lot of time to react and the economy went into recession because of the whole concept about shoring up certain of the sectors like the financial services sector. So when we got to round two with the pandemic, it took the governments about two weeks to react and to know that automatically they had to put the stimulus, in, the, the recovery first or the insurance on, on the citizens and then follow up with stimulus. Of course, the chapter's still being written now. Just when you look at, at the speed of that, I think there's huge hope with, with the pandemic impacting everyone and all of the focus on, on really social good and stakeholderism, that it's not just about making money, it's about our customers, our citizens, our children, having a, as rich a life as we've had, that there is a chance that this, this can be done. And I think that you are such a shining example here in Taiwan of the art of the doable. Now, um, I, I was going to actually mention, because I didn't mention at the front, if anyone else has any questions. So, Christine, I'm just going to ask you, uh, because we forgot to mention it, and I think that there's a way of putting in questions, or uh, are we basically at the end of our time? This is so interesting. I, I think we're nearing the end of our time, but we might be able to take one question if um, the audience, anybody from the audience, both virtual and in person, if you have any, please put them into the Q&A box, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. I think that perhaps it was such a, a, a wonderful uh, discussion yeah. and so thorough and comprehensive that uh, people are just trying to absorb and absorb mm -hmm. the information provided today. So can so, I ask the final question then? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Minister Yang, you have such a powerful message. I would like to know how, your, how you can do this. Continue with your great progress and get this message out because it's so practical. And the way you articulate it is so simple that you can't ignore it. So maybe that's a rhetorical question. <laughs> oh, yeah, I think it's a um, great uh, question. Um, I, I sometimes call myself a poetician, uh, which is um, most of my work is inventing ways of saying things like fast, fair, fun, humor over rumor, <laughs> things like that, so it's easier to spread. So I, I guess I'll just summarize uh, the uh, points that I made uh, during this excellent exchange, uh, and it's my job description. <laughs> it's been on my Twitter, um, and it goes like this. When we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality 
is here. So thank you for this exchange. Live long and prosper, everyone. Thank you. That's fantastic. Incredible. Minister Tang, Janice, thank you for an incredibly profound discussion. A lot of us, a lot of messaging to digest, and as we prepare for days and weeks ahead, and especially for the post-pandemic era, I think we have a lot to think about. So what a thought-provoking discussion today. Thank you very, very much. The Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada has been privileged to have had the opportunity to work with Minister Tang on a number of occasions. And with each session, we continue to uh, become further inspired and amazed with, with her uh, wonderful messaging. So thank you again, Minister Tang, for taking time out of your busy schedule and in particular to attend in person today to share your thought provoking insights. And Janice, Thank you for engaging the minister in discussion. I understand the challenge of moderating a discussion with Minister Tang, but I think everybody will agree that you did a fantastic job. So many, many thanks. And on behalf of the mission chair, vice chair, and all of us at the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada, I'd like to once again thank our supporting organizations the Women's Entrepreneurship Strategy Ecosystem Fund, the Federal Economic Development Agency for Southern Ontario, Air Canada, Global Affairs Canada, DEO, Venture Labs, and especially our friends and colleagues at the Canadian Trade Office in Taipei and the Taiwan Institute of Economic Research. Without their generous support, this virtual mission would not have been possible. And please permit me to also give a shout out to my foundation project team who have worked tirelessly over the past few months to make this virtual mission to Taiwan a success. And we're going to show you a photo of our team that took uh, organized this virtual mission. But stay tuned as our work isn't fi finished. We will evaluate the success after the business to business meetings that are going to be scheduled into the uh, latter part of uh, March. And hopefully we will have news to share with you on the business partnerships, investments, or distribution agreements achieved through this mission. Well, this brings to a close the first Canadian women-only virtual business mission to Taiwan. It has been a long two days, but we hope that you found the mission inspiring and informative. Many thanks to our audience as well for your attention and we hope that this mission will be a catalyst for further deepening economic and people-to-people -people ties between Canada and Taiwan and will result in economically beneficial outcomes for both economies. Good night. Safe journey home to our guests at TICC. Merci beaucoup. Xie xie.